Welcome to the Play Their Way podcast, where we talk about all things in child first coaching. I'm your host, Laura Jane Jones, and today I'm excited to welcome our special guest, Danielle Waterman. Welcome, Danielle. Great to have you with us. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, Danielle's definitely my posh name, so please call me Nolly. <laughs> Danielle Waterman, or Nolly as she's widely known, is a former international rugby player for England, a World Cup winner, Olympian and World Rugby's fullback of the decade. Alongside her highly decorated rugby career, Nolly worked as a coach and educator and since retiring has combined that with extensive work in the media, becoming one of the most recognisable female faces in the game. Nolly, we've opened most of the pods talking about what play means to the person in the hot seat, but when you've been an athlete, an elite athlete, I'm wondering where space for that exists. It absolutely exists. I think sport can, you know, from a general viewing perspective, sport is incredibly special. It brings together all sorts of people and all different types of communities and and that real competitive, um, like, cauldron. But the reality of actually being the person behind that is you're doing things day in, day out, and the repetitive nature is tough. It's tough physically and also it's tough mentally. And um, and so some of the best coaches I've worked with have actually not gone down the route of, you know, the, the boring and mundane and, and included play in all sorts of aspects of our training, whether that's been um, on the field or in skill sessions or in the gym, um, team building. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's probably what kept me engaged um, and also probably got the best out of me as an athlete I think when when coaches included play you're not born an athlete though as kids were all just playing sports so take me back to your earliest memories of getting involved in sports um well with two big brothers um at home (laughs) sport was um and you know that I think it was definitely not sport it was just anything active um we would be out in the garden cycling throwing whatever we could whether it was a sports equipment or not (laughs) um and and you know coming up with all sorts of different games ourselves um and you know we also moved from the UK to New Zealand um at the age I was at the age of five um and that had a huge part in introducing sport in a different way um sport is coached it's delivered it's taught in a very different way in New Zealand than it is in 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 the UK and I think a lot of that is culture um but also the weather um and the you know for me luckily one of the main sports that they love over there their national sport is rugby and having had a rugby playing dad and and all three of us as children love rugby before we went it was kind of yeah get stuck in right from the start there and um I think the the way that they see it as something that everybody does. It's not just the elite. It's not the ones that are really good at sport that take part. It's part and parcel of, of communities. And, and we were, so, you know, as a family, we were welcomed we, into that. Um, we made new friends. We um, t- tried different sports, sports that don't actually even happen in the UK. Um, so, yeah, it was something that was a big part of, making friends and settling us into a whole new country on the other side of the world but at the same time one of the reasons why I absolutely love growing up there. It's interesting you talk about that cultural difference would you say that rugby for children certainly in New Zealand is less sport and more play in that sense? Yeah 100 percent you know although everybody can list off the All Blacks as a six-year-old I had all the All Blacks cards from the Weetabix boxes and I could tell you who was the best player Sean Fitzpatrick was the captain at the time um, I think I even thought I was probably going to be an All Black even though I was a girl um, you know they they just all go out and chuck a ball about um, and what was awesome is that they also um, they take away some of the fear that that young children can have um in particular in rugby kids run around bare feet we played I didn't have my boots until I was I think two or three years into playing over there um and as a 
a little bit of a soft pommy at the start. I was, um, it, it was, it was an interesting one for me having cold feet running around, but it was amazing. And I think that that kind of just epitomizes how they see it. You know, that it, it also means that there isn't the restriction on having to buy equipment. Um, you know, that, that anyone can just go down to the local park and join in, whether that's, um, you know, contact rugby or family touch um, that we used to rock up to and, and parents and, friends in fact like other people would join in as well so it was a whole part of the community and it was about just joining in it wasn't about the winning and the losing play their way is obviously centered a lot in a child first coaching mentality and it's quite a hands-off culture with New Zealand rugby with the barefoot ripper rugby the kids are playing how influential do you think that was to you at the time that it was so child-led play just allows kids to to be creative and to explore and find a way and you know with two big brothers playing rugby in the back garden or sport or whatever we whatever we did I had to find a way to try and beat them (laughs) Um, and and yeah allowing a child to express themselves allows them to work out one why do they love the sport how are they going to to gonna kind of complete the activity um and you know I was a very competitive young girl so for me it was finding a way to win and finding a way to be good and um but actually a lot of the team it wasn't about that it was finding a way to just have fun and I think it definitely meant that I didn't feel different to other people because I was in my own lane doing my own thing and I think that's probably even more emphasized by the fact I was the only girl in my team um and again that was celebrated it wasn't um and and actually yeah the the way that other teams saw it was that we had an advantage because we had something different and I think that that kind of epitomizes as well um when you look at play it's it's who who can be creative who can can use their mind in a different way in their body in a different way for the for the same or a different outcome let's fast forward a few years and you return to the UK and at 16 17 you would go off to Bath College and start an elite rugby pathway really but you were still you know pretty much a kid in your late teens so how much did play feature as the kind of gears switched up to make it a more elite pathway um I actually even though I'd I'd gone down the elite rugby route early on, I was selected into the senior academy at fifteen. Um, whilst I was still, you know, before my GCSEs, it was pretty crazy when I think about it. I also was always encouraged by my family and from teachers to play all sports. Um, and if I go back a couple of years before that, at twelve, I had to finish playing with the boys. The RFU rules say that you you can't play it um, anymore as a girl. I think it's because it's a bit embarrassing if a girl's running around a teenage <laughs> boy. Um, but um, I I was really gutted. But luckily, I played other sports. I did other things that I enjoyed doing. Um, and my teacher at the time sat me down and said, "Look, I know rugby is what you love, but." still have fun with sport like there's so many things that can help you on your path to becoming a better rugby player um and actually I did um a lot of leadership um and in that sport leadership it's about creating games and so from an early uh, like in creating games to engage with people to take part so from a very early age sport was my passion it was something I absolutely loved but I was put down a path that was about encouraging others to take part and I think once you start to realize that not everybody has that absolute innate passion and competitive spirit and brothers that you want to tackle or you know do whatever um that there is a way and a place for everybody and absolutely that should be the case those skills allowed me to be a better rugby player so that understanding about inclusion, about having fun, about um, why did I love sport and what games could I use to get other people to love it um, was very early on in whilst I was still at school. To then go off and I, you know, I was doing netball, athletics and rugby all at a, a reasonable level and I had to specifically choose rugby. I was still encouraged to also do all my other sports for fun. And I... And all of those skills allowed me to be better rugby player. Um, and then fortunately, when I went to Oldfield Academy, which was when I really did make the move to, to rugby being part and parcel of what I was really focusing on from an elite perspective, my coach, Gary Street, was incredible in terms of 
making sure that there was play, making sure that there was fun, making sure that there was not non-competitive, competitive areas within our training. Because he knew that the, there was a huge amount of pressure put on us as young people by ourselves, not, not from other people, you know, by ourselves, because we were thinking, well, our parents are funding us to come to this college and we're part of this pathway. We've been selected to be here and I'm in the academy at the moment. And so, I, you know, and, and all that pressure was coming on. And, and so he had this wonderful way of developing me as a young person, as much as a young rugby player and made rugby fun for me and continued that journey to make sure I didn't lose that because that was what was going to allow me to have the longevity in my career. Because if you don't enjoy something, if you don't, find something that really makes you smile then you're going to lose interest pretty early on and I think that that's where we see a lot of on the elite side of sport people drop out but also when you look at school and when sport becomes boring and something you have to do not something that you want to do Um, so I was very lucky in my career to have firstly parents and brothers that allowed us to play and be creative but then also when I took the other path around the elite side instantly I was around real great people. You've mentioned Gary Street there and he's somebody that I would want to speak to you about because not only was he your coach and and, and leader there at Oldfield Academy, he would go on to coach a a large number of the girls that were in your class through to becoming Rugby World Cup winners. It's a fairy tale story. It's, you know, kind of Hollywood dream stuff. But I'm intrigued how this guy has listened to these girls and kept them for such a long time, how much your training with him was led by yourselves how much success that you all enjoyed both on and off the pitch has been led by the kind of coach that he was I think Gary initially when you first work with a in an elite environment or an environment where it is branded as a sport so you've made a decision to go to a club or you you know and it's not that kind of participation level at school where where everybody is involved because you kind of have to be um you think that everything needs to be serious and 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 you know and you can't have mess around and you know there's a real specific um, outcome to things um and I think early on Gary set a tone within training that the game still mattered so playing still mattered there was still a reason why we were doing things but we didn't have to do it in a boring way we could do it in a creative way because fundamentally rugby as a sport and the vast majority of sports when there's when you look mm-hmm. at tactics when you look at um, decision making when you look at the variety in particular in rugby of the personnel that make up a team being creative is p- part and parcel of being successful so if and, and so he instilled that into us at the same time as asking us, you know, after session, just in a really informal, casual way. And probably when I reflect back, I can see exactly what he was doing, but I never knew that it was a feedback session. He would say, oh, you know, how was training? Like, what did you what did you enjoy? Um, why did you why did you choose to do that activity rather than that one? Or what would you do next in the next training session? And asking those really open questions that were in, is, was in a way where we were walking back to the changing rooms or, you know, at the end of the session, going to a class lesson. Um, and so it wasn't in an intimidating environment. It was just a chat. And then it wouldn't be made a big point of the next session when he'd done that. So it wasn't, a, hey, I told you that. And, you know, so um, it, there's a lot that I suppose I see now that Gary did. That I, And the biggest compliment that you can have to, as a coach is to be told that someone you've coached coaches like you or takes a lot from you. And, you know, I've said that recently to Gary because I see a lot of what he does now in how I, how I coach. Um, but absolutely, he listened to us as a group of young women um, to identify what was the session like, what could be done differently, um, why did we enjoy it, um, what was the purpose of the session, you know, so that he was understanding whether we understood. Um, and I think that, yeah, all of that allowed us to really 
thrive and feel like we were part and parcel of the development and progression of the sessions and stuff as well and that's the big thing how important do you think it was for you at the time whether consciously or unconsciously as young women to feel like you were being listened to I think it's really important I think in particular with with young women I think and girls at school there's a you know I was always one of the sporty kids so for me taking part and and doing PE wasn't a chore it was something I loved doing but it was crazy how much girls just didn't like it, you know, and they just really couldn't be bothered or they really got their back up or about different teachers or different environments. Um, and, you know, I actually did a study when I was a school sports coordinator um, around why there was um, such a drop off in sport between in, in PE and engagement in PE. So obviously it's an expected part of our curriculum, but the biggest thing was engagement. So why and how do they feel about doing the activities or the sports that they do? And so what? why was there this big drop off between primary and secondary? What was happening? And so we did this, we did a, a review of what was happening in the secondary schools and it's unbelievable you know the things that we do in in a sporting environment of why young girls don't enjoy sport you know the first thing they do in year seven one of the schools they offered swimming it's like are you crazy like these girls are you know for the first time at the big school and they want to look nice and they and body conscious and and you're putting them in a pool and for the boys it's a rugby and we're going to from both of those we're going to set you in your ability it's like I remember speaking to a teacher and he said that his eyes were opened because as a school they did fitness testing, the boys did rugby and the girls did hockey and that was how they set for the rest of the year which actually then determined a lot around engagement, about enjoyment, about um, just general participation levels and he had a complaint from a parent at parents evening because his she came in and said why is my son in the bottom group of PE and he said well because in fitness testing he did this and in rugby he did this and she said yeah but he's an international badminton player wow and I think so instantly he said and it was a real eye-opening for me because my mouth hit the floor and he was like exactly he said so we completely change what we do we do fundamental movements we do different things we ask the young people what sports do they like to do and what do they want to do and why do they want to do them and actually look, work with them on on when they come into the school we also work with them on a transition program so when they come up for their transition day they come and see what PE is like and PE kit and they see why it's an important part of their lifestyle not just PE is there because you have to do it like maths and English and science um, and that involvement of the young people and getting them to be part and parcel of their decision making in that subject he said the engagement has totally changed um, obviously my example is of an elite side but it, it ripples down into you know the the switching off of young people into sport is scary and it's not about playing sport, it's about being physically active, it's about having fun and, and enjoying it because it, it not just develops you physically, it develops you cognitively, socially, emotionally, all of those things, that's what activity and play does. And I think if we, if we take that away from our sport lessons or how we engage with young people through school, we don't play and we don't allow them to be part of that journey, of course they're not going to want to do it when they leave. As soon as they finish it, it's like trainers in the bin. Like, no, I don't want to do that anymore. Why would I want to? It's awful. Um, yeah, so it's... Um not quite sure what the question was, but I've gone <laughs> off on one. One of the it's interesting that when you talk about that and that sports coordination role in schools, you know, we talk about play based activity and one of the things that we've talked with other guests about is how is play the enemy of competition and things like that. But there has to be a recognition that not everyone has competition inbuilt in them and doesn't have a competitive drive. I, I know firsthand that you are a very competitive person, but have you seen that through coaching you've got an appreciation that not everyone's like that and how do you counter that if you do realize it it's really interesting because um when I was a school sports coordinator I was really fortunate to have um the option to do plenty of courses and for me it was about growing the not just the um the breadth of my knowledge but also the depth because I, I was very, very aware that the, the significant proportion of young people weren't like me. 
um, especially girls, in terms of growing up with brothers, very competitive, very sporty, um, real extrovert when it came to physical um, activity. Um, and one of the courses that I did was around competition. And so obviously I like rocked in being super competitive, being like, uh, this is class. Like, you know, <laughs> let's, let's see all the how you can do, make things competitive. And actually a big part of it was about how can you make activities different for the sliding scale of comp competitiveness. And it was amazing because it stopped me in my tracks in that how can you differentiate in a session? Because a lot about teaching and coaching is about differentiation, especially when it comes to skill development anyway. Um, and, you know, working with young people. But for me, all I'd known is, competition because why would you not want to win like why mm. would you not take part and try and be the best like because that runs so th deep inside me and I think the course in particular highlighted all of the ways and why young people would feel uncomfortable with that but more so what was important was the strategy of how to engage with them and you know for instance there was a balloon activity for me it was instantly well how many can I do? And, and to the point where I think I was even as soon as I had the balloon, I started <laughs> tapping it to then, OK, well, someone that's not competitive or it, that isn't motivated by co competition, you know, what different parts could they hit the balloon up in the air with? Um, can they see the techniques that other people are using and try and mimic the technique. So it's not about a competition with somebody. It's about engagement. It's about fun um, and like I said, for me, competition is fun and that's a significant part of play. But for other children, it's about creativity. It's about exploring. It's about um, just taking part. Um, and so that was it was an eye opener. And I think I would encourage anybody that, you know, when, in anything, whether that's coaching, teaching, um, business, that we we rely so much on our own instincts and our own experiences which is brilliant but when you're working with a group of people and when you, especially when it's young people and you're trying to motivate engage um, and encourage the room is look looks different to you and 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 so the the more knowledge that you have and there's so many courses out there to be able to explore go and get work experience with different groups the better that you will be because the more you can differentiate, the more you can engage with everybody and the more fun everybody can have and feel that they are welcome and they are part of it. When you learnt that lesson in terms of not everyone's as competitive as me, how influential was that in terms of a child-led coaching experience for you? Uh, uh, did that increase your awareness of listening to the way that children want to be coached and, and putting the ball in their court, so to speak? hundred percent and I think you know I've got lots of I did lots of different jobs and and I think that that's probably what's helped and supported my growth as a coach um, because when people have played at the top level they think oh you can go and coach at the top level it's like when you played at the top level you can go and be a commentator I mean it's like yeah. they're totally different jobs and and so um, I think one of the real experiences that I gained um, around ensuring that young people were part and parcel of their own journey uh, in sport play physical activity was when I worked um, in a special needs school I was doing supply teaching for a year um, I was actually in South Wales and uh, in Astrid Manek and there's a wonderful school um, that worked with um, special educational needs young people um, of all ages and there was a brilliant, brilliant sports coordinator there, P teacher. And I walked into the room and bearing in mind the level of physical disability was some of the worst I'd seen in terms of the challenges that were faced by these young people. Um, and there was a real sliding scale and there was a full-sized um, elite trampoline. There was all sorts of different equipment in this sports hall. And I was thinking, Who, who's going to use all of this? And he obviously clocked when I came in and was really excited to be working with this rugby player. And he came over and he said, Nolly, I'm just going to say to you, do not put what you think sport should look like on any of these young people. And do not think they can't take part before they do. 
He said, we are here to facilitate a safe play physical learning environment. They will find a way. And it was so, so empowering to see these young people that um, had such a range of physical and psychological mental challenges using equipment in different ways being on the trampoline it didn't and 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 it didn't look like trampolining to what we say the sport of trampolining is but it looked like fun it looked like they were fi- they were ex- being creative and it was amazing and i think it was a real eye opener for me that when we think of sport we think of the traditional sports that we see on tv the way that it's played at the top level and that's not what it's about it's about it's about play it's about being creative it's and I think back to my childhood with my brothers and the games that we created on the on the trampoline that they weren't they, you know they're definitely not a sport <laughs> but they were incredibly fun incredibly hard work <laughs> um there was a competitive element in there um and they taught me so much as well you know um so yeah that was that was a big part of my teaching journey but actually when I think about it when I then transitioned into coaching in particular it really stopped me thinking that a drill or an exercise or an activity had to look a certain way a pass is a pass if it goes from A to B it doesn't have to be this perfect pass obviously there's slightly different um, efficiencies but if it if it gets to where it needs to be and everyone's safe or whatever it might be then yeah it's all good. Let's talk about your coaching now and the teams that you're involved with. You are, of course, a coach of the Italian seven side, the Cavaliers. And I'm intrigued how, you know, we look at that as a, a group of very fit, agile young men, very gifted at rugby. But there's a barrier there for you as a coach, and that is a language barrier. So where does play fit in that scenario for you? Um, yeah, the language barrier is definitely real. <laughs> <laughs> um I think what's what's amazing when you can't speak the language of the person that you're working with, you realise how many words you use that aren't necessary. And demons, the, the benefit of demonstration and just go and find a way. Um, and actually working with people that have played at, at, at a reasonably high level um, that come from the backgrounds that they do, um, how regimented they are. And how sterile that environment is for them from a from a learning and from a success level um, and point of view. And actually using different equipment, you know, they'd stop in their tracks and think, what are we what are you doing? Like what's happening? Um, but rugby and, and sport isn't about a regimented way. You know, we play a game that is uh, is incredibly versatile that anything can happen really on the field and they have to be able to react. Um, but the level of fun and the enjoyment when I've just, you know, used water balloons instead of rugby balls or used a nerf instead of a, a, a rugby ball or used different, different pieces of equipment or had different fun and different games. Um, instantly it doesn't mean that we can't have the coaching lesson coaching points and there be an objective to the session and and them understand but they remember that you know when I was a player I remember the sessions where I was laughing and it was something different and it caught me off guard and I had to be creative and think of something in a different way because it made me stop and think so from a cognitive perspective, I absolutely learned more, but I also remembered it and I had more fun and therefore I had that, that level of engagement, which then loops me back to when Gary coached us at, at Oldfield and the fun that we had there. And that when, unfortunately, the higher up the levels that you go in sport, the more people feel like it needs to be more and more serious. And yeah, there are serious elements of it. Of course there are, because there are certain things on the line, but at the same time, there isn't in terms of engagement in terms of um expression building a team um connectivity and those things 
Yours is a, a full circle story, really, because we've talked about the teenage girl at Oldfield. You would go on whilst playing rugby for England to head up the uh, Hartbury College Academy system there for the girls. And, and you know, young girls who are now young women who have many times over won international honours and, and played in World Cup finals last year in Olympic Games. How much was play-centred and listening to those young women from the experiences that you'd had when you were in that role? Um, first and foremost, they were there to get their academic studies um, completed and rugby was the thing that they loved doing. And I went back to that quite a bit because rugby was a thing they enjoyed. So if I didn't make rugby enjoyable, like why were they there? Because they, they, they moved some of them the other end of the country. They'd moved away from families. They were paying a lot of money to be there. Um, and they had the same pressure that I had. They did. It, they were doing exactly what I did. And I could see it in them. I could see everything that I saw, felt of myself in that I didn't need to add pressure as the coach. I didn't need to, you know, it, create different expectations. They had it on themselves. And they knew and they needed to be part of their own journey. Because if I'd told them everything they needed to do to be an England player they were never going to learn how to do it themselves and they were never going to want to to be there because they weren't part of it and I think the more I spoke with them on a one-to-one basis again learning from the different types of personalities the introverts the extroverts within the squad how did I engage with them um what was the best way to connect with them that was a really interesting part for me was giving an opportunity to somebody that wasn't necessarily going to speak openly in front of the group or in a more casual environment actually what they wanted that quieter time they also wanted questions before so they could reflect and bring it so understanding that learning process and that engagement because of the different personalities I had within the team was something really really great for my role at Hartbury actually um and that from just gaining information from someone is 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 isn't one spot size fits all either um but yeah then being part of it allowed them to for me to s- see how they could develop what was their level of knowledge and understanding and interest um and I learned loads from them as well you know I was still deep in my playing career and yes I'd coached and yes I was experienced and yes I was kind of labeled the head of the academy I still had loads I could learn and there was loads of different games that that they came up with or rules that they came up within within a game um, to change the dynamic that I would never think of because they had the different mindset or they were looking at it from a different way so yeah um, and And I think when you commit something to something a lot, again, going back to my own experience, it's really easy to be serious all the time. It's really easy to never let yourself have a brain break. Um, And there were sessions I could see, you know, mentally, physically, they were exhausted. As young people, they have so much going on in their lives, so much pressure um, from family and friends socially academics their teachers coming at them for different things you know their hormones they're physically changing and developing as young women um and being able just to go and play and have fun and be outside in the fresh air or doing something different gave them a freedom it didn't have to be super serious all the time and I think that that became part of the mantra of what we did and there was a time and a place for certain elements especially because elite sport is does have that but the other side of it I think was something that I also realized that sport allows you to do um, and to be if you are looking at developing up the elite pathway is around yes your technical and tactical Um, ability within the sport but also the social element and the team element and working with other people and the social skills and and I think I then focused a lot on that side of it because these girls were away from home they were from all different communities all different areas and 
doing fun activities and different games and play and and allowing them to be creative and show who they were as people through the method of play allowed the team to gel and to become a lot tighter and you know to see now probably yeah like it's amazing that they have gone on to represent their country and you know to see them at an olympic games like is unbelievable like blows my brain you know but i knew how talented they were as rugby people they were always going to probably be on that path actually one of the coolest things and i feel a bit emotional thinking about it is one of the girls recently got married and seeing the whole team with her from her year group i think that that to me shows that the rugby was just part of their experience but the fact that they had sport bring them together and make those friendships and have fun I think play was probably some of the and the team building and the activities and the games that we played from that point of view is what created the foundation of a brilliant um, environment to thrive and you know when I go into business environments now and the work I do now and I see and they're so sterile and they're so serious and they're so intense I'm like and you do a bit of a game and everyone's like looking around and then all of a sudden there's smiles and there's laughter and 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 you kind of just see all of the tension drop out of the body and drop out of the air it's like how have we forgotten about this you know at my mum's 60th birthday I did uh, it was a school party so we did games I was the games teacher I've never seen 60 and 70 year olds like be (laughs) like just have so much fun it changed it but I think I suppose looping back to play and and involving physical activity in play not kind of creative play but you know as in actually moving and sport we need that for for a healthy lifestyle mentally physically we know what what being physically active does for us for a long having longevity in our life and health um so yeah I think probably the most fun I've had is when I've done play activities when I coach adults because they've forgotten how to be a child they've forgotten why they why they started enjoying sport when they're younger and I think I've jumped around a little bit but the shirt presentation I did recently for the World Police and Fire Games with the Cavaliers, and it's actually just been used with some of the senior international teams as well. I had a picture of them as a baby, um, which was hilarious coming from their families, (laughs) Um, but I also got a picture of them when they first started playing rugby, and we talked about remembering that boy, remembering why he loved rugby, why did he play, what did it feel like when he ran around playing, and to play for him and how proud he would be of them where they are now um, as young as players um, but more so as people and so that reflection back is a really important one for people part of that younger generational development and progress that if we're saying and I'm saying that doing play with adults is a brilliant way of them to reflect back to happier memories and to when when things were enjoyable let's make sure that when they do reflect back it was enjoyable it was fun play was part of it they were able to take part in sport and not feel like they had to be the best or win or achieve or be in the a team to enjoy it actually it's just about being a barefooted little rugby (laughs) player running around in new zealand um for me you know i was very lucky to have that and great people but it was the people around me the adults around me that facilitated that um, and we have a real responsibility when you work with young people to to allow that to to continue to happen. So their story, when they look back, is is the same. Nolly, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed. If we've piqued your interest in our coaching catch-ups, head to the website for more info on how you can get involved, www.playtheirway.org. And as always, there are plenty of other free resources available there. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, be sure to leave us a review and share this with someone else who you think might like it too. And follow Play Their Way on social media, at Play Their Way on TikTok, X and LinkedIn, and at Play Their Way UK on Facebook and Instagram. Listener.